<coughs> brother mentioned brother Andrew. Now, I think it was brother Andrew. I know it was someone who was taking Bibles into the old communist. Let me, is that better? All right. Yeah, get me best side. I'll, I'll, is that better? I notice you haven't got that slimming effect on. Now, I asked him to get that slimming app. Obviously, he can't find it. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, one of the times Brother Andrew was taking Bibles in, and as he said, he never hid them. This particular time, he got to the border, and they found them. So they took them out of the car and piled them up on the uh, counter in the office. And uh, it was there a minute or two. And a, a man came in who was known to the border guards. And he looked at the, he said, are they Bibles? Yeah. How much do you want for them? Mentioned the price. There you are. He was selling them on the black market, you see. <laughs> and they were making a few, whatever they were, the, the currency it was. So he took these Bibles out into his car and took them into the country. So they still got in, didn't they? Yeah. Then Brother Andrew stood there and said, What am I doing? Oh, you can go. What about the Bibles? What Bibles? I can't see any Bibles. Go. Oh. So apart from the Lord blinding high, eyes that they can't see them, he always provides somebody with the money. John chapter 1, down from the first 13 verses. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness, we have all received, and grace for grace. Isn't that a wonderful verse, that last one? Of his fullness, we have all received, and grace for grace. This is certain verses that stand out, and, 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 and then 
It's about how many times you've read them. They suddenly grab you, don't they? And that, I think that's one of those verses as well. Yes, uh, when I talk about our relationship with God, because our relationship between God has, and man is changed over the years since God originally created man. We can see from reading the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, that after man was created, God made a garden specially for man to live in. And it says, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. And we can get an idea of the kind of relationship that uh, Adam had with God by reading Genesis 3, 8. Now, I know this is after they'd taken from the uh, forbidden fruit, but he says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It must have been a relationship of friendship because this is what you do with a friend, isn't it? Walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Walking by a stream. Um, friends we had in, in Towin, in Wales, the Abadubi Towin. Absolutely a wonderful friend. We knew him from the Blackburn Church. They moved down there. But he was more than just a friend. His name was Jim Taylor. And uh, you see, he was more than a friend. He was a father in the Lord. Because certain things happened at the time that June and I were staying with them. And so I'd got this, their father figure, who was also a very good friend, to, uh, to, to pray, to care, that love of God. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to do. He used to love walking up the promenade with him, just talking about things. Quite often, I would say to June, it'd be a beautiful day like today, and I would say, it would just be nice to walk up the, up the front of Towin with Jim. Just because we were friends. And because we could talk about the Lord together as well. And uh, he was a real godly man and a real encourager in the Lord. We want those, don't we? We need encouragers in the Lord. There's so many people. They want to do this, they want to do that, they want to stand up here. Well, I'm telling you, it's not a... It's a terrifying thing to stand up here. The only thing I'm, I know is I'm grateful for is you won't start throwing things. But we need encouragers in the Lord. You know, it's, it's something, something that all of us can do. So we had, must have had a friendship relationship with, with, with God. But, of course, as we all know, they took that forbidden fruit, the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> Excuse me. Better. And God had had to put them out to make sure they didn't take from the tree of uh, life. <clears throat> But in Habakkuk 11, uh, sorry, chapter 1, verse 13, it says about God, For your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favour. And this is what did it. But God could look on Adam favourably up to that point, because in verse 31 of Genesis 1, it says, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good which meant that Adam was very good at that point. But of course, after they sinned, that relationship changed. And 
like I said, he could not look on wickedness with favour. And that uh, relationship changed. And from that time up to the time that the Lord Jesus Christ came with the message of salvation, we have had a very different type of relationship. We have God and people. Leviticus 26, verse 12, it says, I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. And there is a gap that needs to be bridged. So God introduced mediators, someone to approach God on behalf of man. Someone to remind the people to offer the sacrifices and to perform the acts of worship. And so the priesthood were brought in to act as go-betweens, to stand between God and man, to offer the sacrifices of atonement for the sins of the people so they could be accepted by God. Prophets were used to get us back to a working relationship with God. Some of them, as you know, were mistreated. Because God had, a few times he tried raising up men to preach repentance before the flood, but to no avail. And so he called out, Afterwards, he called out Abraham to make a special people for himself and his chosen people. And although the combined efforts of the priesthood, the prophets, the good kings that they eventually had succeeded to a certain extent, an evil king comes to the throne and leads the people away after idols and false gods. And so the relationship was one of inconsistency. It was a relationship in which the people could not approach God by themselves. In Exodus 19, 21, where Moses is called to Mount Sinai, and God tells Moses to go and warn the people not to approach the mountain. He said, go down, warn the people lest they break through to the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. There was no way at all by which the people themselves could approach God. They had to use the mediator, the priesthood, one of the prophets. And of course, despite the times when God demonstrated what happens when the people follow him fully, such as in 1 Kings 8, verses 10 and 11, where it says, the priests could not stand to minister. For the glory of the Lord, build the house. What would we do that happened? I've often wondered, what would I do if that happened? But the glory that preaches in the middle of a sermon and the glory of the Lord God. What would we do? Well, we couldn't, we couldn't do anything, could we? We'd be awestruck. I think we'd have to worship. We wouldn't be able to do anything else. But just imagine that. Suddenly, in the middle of a sermon, whoosh. Yeah. But it didn't seem to make much difference to them. They experienced this, it didn't make much difference. They seemed to forget those times of rich blessing and go their own way with the result of uh, some tragedy befalling them, like an, uh, an invasion or exile. How many times do we think when we read like uh, Daniel, he was a prisoner of war, wasn't he? We don't think of that. Daniel was a, started off with his friends, they were prisoners of war. We forget these things. And then it wasn't until the times that God did something and the people repented, they turned back to God, and they got like a yo-yo relationship with God. The third relationship is the relationship since Calvary. This is the relationship of sons. Galatians 4. 
when the fullness of the time came, God, notice that, the fullness of the time. He's always on time. You don't have to be like that. He's always on time. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Well, that's another fantastic couple of verses from God's word. It doesn't matter where you look. There's always verses that can absolutely bless you down to your toenails. Some may say, but Adam was a son. Because it says in Luke 3, 38, Adam, the son of God. Yeah, no, he does. You see, Adam was a created son. And we are not created as sons because we lost that sonship before we were born in Adam. Neither are we like Christ, an only begotten son, because the Bible refers to him as the only begotten son. The only one. So we come into neither of these categories. Our sonship is neither created nor begotten. But we are begotten by adoption. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 5, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind mercy of his will. And as you know, adoption means to be placed as a son or daughter in another family. Well, each and every Christian obtains the place of a child and the right to be called a son the moment they believe. In adoption, they are given the position of a son or daughter of God. All Christians, now get this, don't misunderstand this. All Christians are sons of God. Don't forget the times we were talking of. Even the daughters are sons. You'll get me in a moment. Because it isn't a physical thing. It's a legal thing. Unless, of course, you ladies have got four sisters and your father is called Zilothihead. Because that changed everything, didn't it? The reason we are counted as sons is that the inheritance is normally passed down through the male line. I know things have changed, but that is why we are referred like that. This is why Christ himself became the firstborn. Colossians 1, 15 says that he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. Psalm 89, 27 says, I also shall make him my firstborn. Now this refers to priority of position rather than of origin. The fact is that Christ as the eternal son holds the position of priority in relation to all creation, in that he was before all things, he created all things, and by him all things consist. 
He is the firstborn. Christ is the firstborn of the virgin, which establishes his purity. Christ is the firstborn among his brethren, that establishes his primacy. He is the firstborn from the dead, that establishes his potency. He is the firstborn of every creature, that establishes his preeminence. And in all things, Christ is the firstborn. I don't think I made that up. I got that from someone else. As far as I remember, I found it in uh, Ian Paisley's uh, commentary on Romans. It was very good as well. See, it's not that he was born first, but that he holds the highest, the fullest, and the most glorious position of all. Another fantastic couple of verses, Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What a few verses, fantastic few verses. They're wonderful, aren't they? And the point is, if we don't bow the knee now, we'll be forced to bow the knee later on. Someone said to a pastor friend of mine, he, he didn't actually go to the church. He was visiting for some reason. He went to a different church, this guy. And he said to my friend, the pastor, the Lord has told me when he's coming back. Oh. The Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. Yeah, I know. But he's told me the month and the year. I don't know whether he's still waiting or not. <laughs> don't some folk get some silly ideas hey, you know we say that things don't we there's a car at the, car at the side of the road with a jack under oh have you got a fat tire no it's only fat at the bottom you know we do we say that thing we say that things about god's word sometimes don't we i read about uh, it was uh, the results of some uh, research that had been done. I think they must have been uh, genetic scientists, and they announced they published their findings. We have come to the conclusion that all of us are descended from one original pup. Read this; it's a lot cheaper who we have called Adam and Eve. And this took place over so many generations. And if you work the generations out, guess what? It comes to exactly the same date as this says it does. And then they said, just because we've come to the same conclusion as the Bible, doesn't mean we agree with what the Bible says. That needs thinking about. Oh well, never mind. Where are we? Oh. Every tongue should come. Yes. That is position. What was his position with God? This is my beloved son. The position of father and son. And we also have that father son relationship. We're also like that. But how is it that we can be have that same relationship? Romans 8.15, by adoption. Rome, uh, Ephesians 1.5, by predestination. Born of the Spirit, the witness of the Spirit. So it is by adoption first. Romans 8.15, you have received the Spirit of adoption as some. To adopt means receive the child of another and treat it as one's own. 
which is exactly what God has done to us. When they want to uh, adopt a child, they have to answer searching questions to see if they're capable or fit. Well, God doesn't need to answer their own any questions. He, he created us in the first place. God fulfills every possible test as to be able to provide for his adopted children. You know, in the first place, he provided the ideal conditions, the Garden of Eden, until they decided they would have a, a bite of that, uh, that um, uh, is it funny how your mind goes blank? Do you have knowledge and thank you? <laughs> yeah, a couple of weeks, some months ago, in our restaurant where we live, one of the things on the menu was Eve's pudding. I said, what's Eve's pudding? It's apple. I said, what's he got to do with Eve? You've got to explain things to them. I said, apples aren't, weren't even mentioned until, see the Psalms? Yeah. <clears throat> so it, it not only provided the ideal place as the Garden of Eden, but in the future, he's already prepared a place, or he's preparing a place. Because Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I don't forget, creation was six days, wasn't it? Because on the seventh day, he said God rested. So if God could create the world and everything else that we can see through the big telescopes in six days, just imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus says, I'll go to prepare a place for you. How long has he been doing it? What a place he's preparing for us. Ooh. Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5. When the fullness of the time came, I think we've read it before, God sent it forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law in order that you might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons but our adoption is also of the spirit now many things are said about the holy spirit the gifts of the spirit the fruit of the spirit walking in the spirit i haven't heard much about the adoption of the spirit obviously i'm only being quick on these i would love to hear Bible studies on this lot. It would take quite a while. Ephesians 1 5 says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. As soon as we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, predestination kicks in and we automatically come into that special relationship as an adopted son of the great God Himself. So we are sons by predestination as well. John 3, verses 5 and 6, we are sons because we are born of the Spirit. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Nicodemus couldn't understand when Jesus spoke like that. He could only think of that physical act of birth. Obviously, too big for that. He couldn't grasp the fact that he was dead spiritually and he had to be born spiritually. He did not realize that when God told Adam he would die if he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he was speaking of spiritual death, not just physical death, although that followed as a matter of course. And so we have the situation of mankind living in a state of spiritual death, separation from God, the giver of life. And so we cannot know life until we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and take the life he gives us. John three sixteen to 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Once we have been born of the Holy Spirit, we know we are sons by the witness of the Spirit. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now notice one thing. Notice that the Spirit does not witness to the body. But contrary to what some would have us believe, bodily excitements and physical phenomena are no guarantee of the witness of the Spirit to a genuine work of grace. The witness of the Spirit is not to flesh, but to Spirit. And those who say that speaking in tongues, raising your arm, dancing, visions, going down and prayed for, or the use of any or all of the list of gifts of the Spirit is a sign of spiritual maturity, they must be wrong because it says the Spirit witnesses to the Spirit, you see. And even though I like, and I have been in many meetings like that, and I do love meetings like that, and I've been blessed through it, I have to say again, the Spirit does not witness to our flesh. He witnesses to our spirit. Christ himself gives us the authority to become the sons of God. The Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit that this is so. Each Christian has this in inside information to the fact of their personal salvation. It's a limited witness because it's limited to those who are in Christ. And so we have adoption, predestination, spiritual birth, and the witness of the Spirit. Just some of the ways we can know that we are His. 1 John chapter 3, verses uh, 1 and 2. See, how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. Let us be no, in no doubt as to our standing in the Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to God our Father, because it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, and it is all through and in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the thing we have to do first. We have to come to know and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And then we can know for certain that we are part of the family of God. That one day, as the Bible says, we shall be like him. I'll try and finish by repeating a, the last verse of a song. Jesus, my Lord, on that great day, with sin and sorrow washed away, you will return in clouds so bright. Come for your church, a glorious sight. Jesus, my Lord, Savior divine, together. Notice that, together, for the best of time. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to sing, it's a such a beautiful song, face to face.